Engineer is doing drugs. No. No they aren't. This just happened. So, I had a laptop system board fail. Under warranty. No problem. Engineer comes on site. Does the job. All good. Ten minutes later, I'm called down to where he was working by a member of management saying that he must have been doing drugs in there because there's a syringe in the bin. There's about ten members of staff all freaking out. It's thermal compound. Edit, banana this got big. My biggest post ever. Aren't those like labeled thermal paste? Huh, must be slang for heroin. Arctic silver's still popular, right? Could totally be drug slang. My dad once found an empty thermal compound syringe in my room. We had a really long talk. I don't blame him. That banana can lead to harder stuff, like solder. Another tech office misunderstanding, once had our dock control person come up to me, the engineer in the office, and ask me do you know how to build a bomb? Sheepishly, I responded with well, I guess so, technically. Took us a minute to realize she was leaning about our bill of materials system, and had not chosen her words very carefully. Give them a shoddy bomb casing filled with used pinball machine parts. That reminds me, I haven't had my fix of dollar cold place today. No wonder I was running a little hot. I went to a gun shop after work to get some snap caps. As I pulled out my wallet a syringe of Shinetsu fell out of my pocket. People in line immediately called me out on it and I had to profusely explain how I'm a hardware tech and that sure as hell isn't heroin. Thanks for naming a specific kind. That looks significantly different than the kinds of thermal I use. I can understand their reasoning now. Originally I thought of arctic silver, which looks nothing like a drug needle. I'm pretty sure I knocked a user out from nearly 300 miles away. I work help desk for a retail store chain in the UK. I had a call from a store about a till drawer that wasn't opening after a transaction. And GT, me, could you check that the till is plugged into the back of the PC? And GT, user, sure, one second. I hear him rummaging under the desk. And GT, user, yeah. It's plugged in. The POS software occasionally forgets which COM port to operate for the till drawer. And GT, me, I'm just going to try to open the drawer manually. Can you stand back from the drawer so it doesn't hit you? And GT, user, haha, sure. I open up some D and try to open the drawer. Echo A and GT, COM 1. Dot. Nothing. Echo A and GT, COM 2. Uck, thud. And GT, me, hello? I heard something. Did the drawer open? And GT, user. And GT, me, hello? After around 20 seconds a woman picks up the phone laughing. And GT, user 2, user had to go to the bathroom to clean his nose, the till drawer hit him in face and bust his nose. We'll call you back later. Whenever I want to reach through the screen and smack a user, I'll always think back to this story and remember that it's possible. Well, you did warn them. I've always warned them since a colleague opened the drawer while the user was still under the desk and they lifted their head and knocked the float all over the floor. I have seen this list of things that if someone would invent one of them they could be a billionaire overnight. I am pretty sure that punching someone through the internet is on that list. This is a pretty neat proof of concept. Good luck and Godspeed future billionaire. And GT. Could you just look carefully through the till drawer? Open drawer underscore thwack underscore. And GT, how about now? Now walk towards the light. Even if there were warning lights, large warning label and a warning siren, you know some users would just stand there like sheep from Dumbfound Island. Hopefully pain is better teacher. Don't bother sending a tech, I'll be dead by then. So my story starts on what was a normal day taking calls on the front line for a large cable company. The job pays well and for the most part the people I deal with are fairly nice to talk to. Quite often we'll get calls from seniors, especially in the morning, who have premise equipment issues such as snow on screen or no signal on their TV sets connected to our digital equipment. Now my heart does go out to some of these folk because up until recently, past few years, we would supply straight analog cable to many homes, coaxed direct from wall to TV with scrolling guide. However most cities we service nowadays require our digital equipment to receive channels, and this has caused a lot of frustration with older people who don't know how to operate 
said equipment, EA. Always having your TV set on video or HDMI to get picture. So oftentimes we get customers who are repeat offenders with long ticket histories of these types of issues. So anyway, I get a call from an older gentleman who's quite bitter and mean right off the bat, doesn't like that I asked for his address, telephone number to verify the account, hates that he has to speak with a machine before reaching an agent, etc. I have some experience handling these types of customers, however this call was going to be a little different. I spent over 45 minutes with this guy, we'll call him Mr. Smith, trying to get his TV set connected to the digital box properly so he could receive a picture. No luck. He was getting clearly frustrated by the whole ordeal and started blaming me for not being able to do my job properly how I was useless, etc. Whatever. Like I said, I've dealt with this before so I tried my best not to take it personally, but eventually I had to ask him if we could book a service tech to the home, a courtesy call, to get his TV working correctly. Unfortunately, our booking calendar was showing an appointment three days out. That's when he dropped this on me. Don't bother sending a goddamn technician, because I'll be dead by then. I'm 94 and TV is the only thing I have left. Are you really going to make me wait for a tech? I instantly felt bad. I mean, I've heard every complaint in the book as to why people don't want to wait for a tech but this one kind of got to me. I'm in my mid-twenties so honestly I can't even imagine how it must feel to utter those words. So I spoke with my supervisor, who said they'd see if we could get someone out earlier. But we couldn't promise anything. So I let Mr. Smith know and he was predictably not very happy with my answer. At that point it almost sounded like he started to cry and went into how he has no family left, and no friends that come visit, this was after I asked if there was anyone in his building that might be able to help, man. I felt terrible, so I took it upon myself to ask Mr. Smith if I could pay a visit, he lived in a small city over from where I was, not very far to drive. He was a little shocked I was willing to do this, but sounded thankful I was willing to come out and help him personally. So I head over, get to the residence and meet him, within 30 seconds I had the cable running again, simple input change, and even brought him a simplified remote for his set-top box to avoid this problem in the future. That's when he started crying. He goes into how he hasn't actually spoken or really interacted with anyone for years. He gave me a hug and told me how thankful he was that I came out and helped him, and told me how sorry he was for being so mean earlier on. I said it was no problem and I was happy to help, and that was it, I left. Three weeks later, my supervisor comes to my desk and asks me if I could come speak with her for a bit about an account for Mr. Smith. Turns out, he sent the cable company a letter outlining how thankful he was for helping him with his issue and how it really made an old man happy again for once in a very long time. The letter was framed and put on our front entrance to retail. I guess the moral of this story is no matter how nasty someone is to you over the phone, Sometimes they're not always a terrible person and just going through a lot. I still think about Mr. Smith occasionally when I get those nasty customers and it makes me feel a little better. Anyway thanks for reading just thought I'd share how this one call changed my outlook on life smile. Oh, God, when you said your supervisor called you in, I was certain the man died. Glad I was wrong. Well this certainly wasn't the standard TFDS post I was expecting. I, um, didn't come here to feel. I work for Dell, and I'm almost certain I'd get fired for doing this. My roommate got fired from Best Buy for doing a voluntary install at a customer's house on his own time after they had problems with the original Best Buy install. Reminded me of this from Grand Budapest Hotel and GT, rudeness is merely the expression of fear. People fear they won't get what they want. The most dreadful and unattractive person only needs to be loved, and they will open up like a flower. M. Gustav. Yeah. Some years back when automatic public access Wi-Fi was non-existent, I worked at a hospital and we had to manually configure the computer for our network along with confirming you had an AV app installed and updated. We only allowed inpatients staying long term to have access. We were planning a better system, but it hadn't been implemented and computer network access for patients was new. There were some concerns as they were being placed on our production network. but. 
those tickets were priority 3. Employee work had priority. But, I show up in the bone marrow transplant area a day after a ticket is logged. The patient is no longer there. Due to hippo I cannot be told more. If you don't know, BMT is typically for cancer. If the patient isn't there any longer without warning, there is likely only one reason, and it's not a happy one. This really bummed me out. I mean, I had tears. I thought about some poor guy wanting to reach out via internet to send a few last emails, see a vacation spot he once visited, whatever he wanted and our policy and my workload prevented that. I went to the boss and told him these cases need to be priority to and go to the top of the queue for P2 cases. P1s were only where medical care was being prevented by the outage patient in the room who can't get care. About broke down giving my justifications and said if he said no, I'd go each step up the IT management ladder all the way to the CEO to make my case. He approved the change and we started giving patients higher priority. About a year after, we had a rich guy who had a nephew stay in the BMT, and he then donated enough computers to put a laptop in each room. We locked them down for malware slash virus and would re-image after each patient left and it all worked out. Kudos to the FT. Worth Cats minor league baseball team management for that donation.